Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I'll break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Today, we're going to discuss a topic that is of critical interest to the United States and Israel, Iran. Its nuclear program, its efforts to revive, the efforts to revive the 2015 nuclear pact, and the recent Iranian election, and what it means or doesn't mean for diplomacy, as well as Tehran's rogue behavior in the Middle East. To discuss this with me, I'm honored to have as our guest this week, Shoshana Bryan. Shoshana Bryan is Senior Director of the Jewish Policy Center and Editor of In Focus Quarterly. She's a specialist in U.S. defense policy and Middle East affairs. She was previously Executive Director and Senior Director for Security Policy at JINSA. She has worked with, with the Strategic Studies Institute of the U.S. Army War College and the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv and lectured at the National Defense University in Washington and the American Service Academies. And her work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, the New York Sun, the Defense News, Forbes.com, and on BBC, World, OAN, and Newsmax. Let's start with the Iranian election. First, can you explain to us exactly what an election means in the context of Iran and the Islamic Republic? And what do we need to know about the winner, Ibrahim Raisi, and what, if any, impact he'll have on the nuclear talks going on now in Vienna and Iranian behavior towards the United States and Israel? So you start with a small question, right? (laughs) Elections in Iran, first of all, uh, you can't just decide to run for president or any other office in Iran. There is a Supreme Guardian Council. It vets the candidates. This presidential election, I think they vetted out about 1,200 people, okay? No women, no dissidents, no whatevers. They they ended up with six people who were permitted by the Guardian Council to run. Now, of those six, any of those six might have been acceptable to the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei, but one of them is a particular favorite of his, and that is Ibrahim Raisi. And so shortly before the vote was scheduled, uh, four candidates dropped out, leaving you with a couple of guys handpicked to run in the so-called election. On top of which, it should be noted that less than 50% of Iranians voted in this election uh, because they knew that the result was done in advance, because they didn't want to grant it legitimacy. And about 13% of those ballots that were cast were actually blank. So you had a very small turnout because the Iranian people understand perfectly well that this has nothing to do with voting and elections. So it's not an election, it's an anointment or an appointment of someone. Now, why is this important and why is Raisi important? Um, Raisi is on the short list to succeed the Ayatollah Khamenei if and when the Ayatollah passes. I'm not suggesting he will. But well, he will eventually, Raisi, right? I mean, he's not immortal. He will eventually. <laughs> and Raisi is um, somewhat younger. So he is the Ayatollah in waiting, so to speak, which makes him very important, by the way, because not only is he today's voice, all he is is the, um, the mouthpiece for the Ayatollah in the form of a president. He will speak to the West, and some people will actually pretend that he's a president. Haaretz, surprisingly, the Israeli newspaper said that he was elected in a landslide, right? So, not exactly. But he is important because he's the mouthpiece. And anything he says, everything he says, comes directly from the Ayatollah. So when you get to negotiations, you know that what he tells you is the position the Ayatollah will accept. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Now, but how does he figure into the calculations of the Biden administration and the others involved with the so-called indirect talks going on in Vienna right now to revive uh, the Iran nuclear deal? I, I don't think he figures in at all. The State Department spokesman said, I, I don't know if it was this morning or 
yesterday, but I read it this morning. Um, Ned Price, the State Department spokesman, said what I think is the truth. The United States believes that a negotiated um, solution to the nuclear impasse is the only possibility. We wish to pursue, we the United States, the Biden administration, wish to pursue diplomacy as our means of securing the future of a non-nuclear Iran. Price did say it doesn't matter who the president is. No, it yeah. doesn't, because the Iranian position is not likely to change. Yeah, so um, there was some thought, though, um, um, certainly in the mainstream media, that whatever deal is going to go down in Vienna needed to sort of be enacted before he took office so as to place any quote-unquote blame for the shortcomings of, of the nuclear deal from the Iranian point of view, which is somewhat ironic considering how tilted towards Iran interests it is, um, before he takes office, that can be blamed on Rouhani, the, uh, the outgoing um, mouthpiece. And then um, the Ayatollah Khamenei and his chosen person can reap the benefits of um, you know, the end of sanctions. What do you think of that? Uh, actually, I disagree, because had that been the case, I think the Iranians would have pushed for some concrete measure while Rouhani was still in Vienna. And they were the ones who postponed the talks before the elections. It was their decision to step away. So if you were thinking, yes, uh, Rouhani will get something, but it will fall apart, and then we can blame him and all, the Iranians don't appear to have seen it that way. The Iranians appear to believe that their position is strengthened by having a, um, a trusted president. Interesting, interesting. So a lot of this kind of figuring, a lot of the sort of uh, Kremlinology um, that the American press has been doing with respect to what's going on in Iran, with a lot of talk about moderates versus hardliners. I mean, that's, that's a constant meme of of analysis of Iran in the mainstream media. I, I guess you're kind of dismissing a lot of that. All of it. <laughs> dismissing all of it. And I, let me say that the Iranians have a position here. It is a fundamental position, and that is not a pun. They fundamentally believe certain things. So does Hamas, so does Hezbollah, so do other people. They are not looking for moderates and hardliners. They are looking to pursue their aims, and they're very clear about their aims. Raisi gave a press conference in which he outlined his aims, and included in those are support for the militias in Iraq, in Lebanon, and Hamas in Gaza. These people believe things, mm -hmm. and they pursue what they believe. And I think we need to give them the credit for what they believe. I don't like what they believe. I want them to lose. I want them to lose big time. But don't delude yourself into thinking there are moderates and, and hardliners here because you can't be a moderate and gain power in Iran or in, in uh, Hamas or in Hezbollah. Where's the, the moderate Hezbollah? Come on. Yeah, I, I think part of this is obviously projection or wishful thinking on, part of the, uh, on the part of the West. I mean, when President uh, Barack Obama was uh, trying to sell the original nuclear deal, he spoke of it as a means by which Iran could, quote unquote, get right with the world. I, th I think that was probably reflecting a lot of that belief that moderation, um, accommodating themselves to the West was really what Iran wants. But I guess what you're saying, and I think which is clearly true, is that it has nothing to do with the reality of the Islamic Republic, of the ideology of the people that run it. And um, their goals are, as you say, quite clear. They, you know, you, you described it, you laid it out very clearly about Iraq, you know, Syria, Lebanon, you know, um, the Palestinian groups. They're interested in regional hegemony. They're not interested in, you know, playing nice with the West. And, uh, you know, it's sort of, these are just illusions. These are stories that people in the United States tell themselves to justify appeasement of these people who have, as you say, they have beliefs and they stick to them. Or not appeasement. They may really believe those things. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of chutzpah to say, I know that you want what I want, but that's what Americans often do. What do Americans want in the world, really in the big, broad world? 
we basically want a peaceful world where people live nicely with each other and they don't kill you for your religion. They don't kill women. Yeah. We want nice things. And so we assume, because it's in our nature, our nice nature, to assume nice things about other people. Other people are not always nice. And it's chutzpah on our part not to understand that. It's dangerous. Yeah, well, it's dangerous chutzpah because the point of the nuclear deal and sort of this entire strategic approach um, is really to the benefit of the, of the Iranian regime. And it's hard. And it's uniformly, as you you correctly pointed out to us, it's uniformly hardline leadership. Um, yet these are the stories that um, that we tell ourselves to. Uh, sort of give us an excuse to avoid uh, having to confront them or having to deal with the reality of what Iran actually wants. And that, you know, but that leads me to another question. Um, I think it goes to sort of more fundamental, if we can get back to that word fundamental. What is, you know, there are, there are people who, who believe, and I think Michael Duran is one of them, who, see, who saw the original nuclear deal and see the revival of it now, the attempted revival of it, as not merely a mistake, you know, a, a misperception about what Iran is and what Iran wants, but a strategic realignment of the United States away from Israel and Saudi Arabia and the, and the Sunni Muslim countries to one of really a rapprochement, a, a better, you know, a real relationship with Iran. Do you think that's, number one, do you think it's possible? And I think I know the answer to that question, you know, to actually affect such a, such a strategy. But do you think it's true? Do you think that's really what people in the administration want? Or is it just that they believe that this is the way to a peaceful relationship with Iran? You can believe both of those things. Um, I think the Obama administration very much believed that Iran could be a positive player in the region. Uh, he was interested in sliding away from Israel, sliding away from Saudi Arabia. Although, interestingly, I, I just came across the reminder that Barack Obama supported the UN resolution that um, made the Houthis into terrorists in the uh, Yemen war against Saudi Arabia, and he was in favor of the Yemenite government that was deposed by the Houthis. So he wasn't on the Shiite side at that moment in that case. But basically, yes, believed that we could leave the region and it would be a peaceful region without us. And since it was the Saudis who need us and the Israelis who need us, the Sunnis basically plus Israel who need us, um, we withdraw from them and we make Iran nice and we fix the problem. And the Biden people, I don't know, they're a little more realistic, I think, about Iran. But removing the U.S. air defenses from large parts of the region is not a good sign for our longtime allies. By the way, it includes yeah. Jordan. Um, the removal of the U.S. air defenses includes Jordan. That is, that is a key point. And um, you speak of the people in the Biden administration, certainly Secretary of State Antony Blinken has a very moderate sounding approach to Iran. He has done his best to reassure Congress and the Jewish community, the pro-Israel community, that his intentions with regard to our Iran and its intentions towards Israel are honorable, that, you know, they, they haven't, they're not willing to abandon America's allies. And yet they're pursuing the same strategic course as the Obama administration did. The, the talks in Vienna, the, you know, the indirect talks seem to be moving in the same direction um, you know, how, how much can we trust to the judgment of, you know, how, how much judge, trust do you place in, in uh, Secretary of State Blinken's judgment with respect to Iran and the rest of uh, the uh, Biden foreign policy team? That's a difficult question because I don't know him. Uh, I would agree with you that he has commitments to Israel and to certain longstanding U.S. policies. And I don't doubt that for a minute. But you can have that and be wrong at the same time. And I do think he is aware of the problems of Iran, but I think he wants to get over them. And sometimes if you want to get over a problem badly enough, you ignore some of the warning signs in your way. I am concerned that he will do that. Um, I don't know for sure, but it looks that way. And by the way, I would say something about those what you call indirect talks in Vienna, um, that's where the United States sits in the corner and the Iranians are sitting with the Chinese and the Russians 
and the French and the Germans, and they're all having a good old time discussing the future of the region without us. And if that doesn't make you nervous, um, regardless of what you think of, of Antony Blinken, it should make you nervous. China and Russia have their own concerns in that part of the world, and they're sitting there having a discussion with the Iranians. We're yeah, not well, in that, the that, That's, you know, I'm I worried. think you, you, you make a good point that the, and I think when we talk about these talks in, in, in Vienna, um, the United States supposedly still isn't directly engaging with Iran, and that's the excuse for not being at the table with the other parties, and that the you know the um, you, you know the Europeans, the French, the British, um, they are scurrying back and forth, supposedly relaying the messages, which sounds kind of like a comedy routine. But since everybody knows what everybody is saying, uh, but to maintain the fiction that the United States still is not really recognizing Iran, not dealing with Iran until they re-enter the nuclear deal. But these talks, you know, are, um, as you say, um, very friendly to Iran and very awkward for the United States. And yet, it's, it's, it seems pretty much a done deal that at some point soon, there is the, the the 2015 deal will be the JCPOA will be reinstated, and um, the reports say that the Iranians want something, the Americans want something. Both of those wants are unrealistic, since the Americans want um, a commitment from the Iranians to negotiate a new deal after this one is 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 reinstated and the sanctions are lifted, and the Iranians want a commitment that it will never be taken away, um, you know, that no future administration can go back on what Biden agrees to, which would require a treaty, um, which is one thing that both Obama and Biden are determined not to present to Congress because they know a treaty could never pass. But if this deal, if and when, and I think when is more the operative word than if, what will it mean, you know, on the ground in the Middle East and for the United States and Iran and and uh, American allies. What what is it going to mean when this when this happens? When this much longed for, as far as the Biden administration and much of the mainstream media is concerned, that sort of the Trump decision to to uh, throw it away that that's that will be erased. What will this mean for the Middle East? It will mean that the United States has lost all credibility in the region because we made a series of promises, and Biden made some promises too. And if he goes back on them, which let's be honest, it is more likely that the US will backtrack than that Iran will backtrack because Iran, as I say, has fundamental interests here. It's never gonna renegotiate the deal. It has a great deal. It has a deal the United States agreed to. No, it's not signed. No, it's not a treaty. No, it doesn't really live, but the Iranians have it. And the idea that they would go forward and give up things for nothing is unrealistic. More likely, we will continue to offer them little bits of inducement, which they will happily take. Uh, for example, there was the, you notice that the Iranians paid their arrears at the United Nations. Where did they get that money? It appears to have come from money that was being held by South Korea. South Koreans were holding about $8 billion in Iranian assets frozen when the United States asked for countries to freeze those assets. In January, the South Koreans uh, had a ship hijacked by Iran, and Iran demanded a billion dollars ransom for the ship. Trump administration said no. Biden administration said, well, let's kind of talk about it. Anyway, um, the South Koreans have given at least a billion of their eight billion to Iran. So that's the kind of inducement that erodes our position without announcing that we've eroded our position. Uh, but we have, and our allies are very aware of it. Everybody sees what we've done. Taking the Houthis off the terrorism list, that was a gift to Iran. Everybody knows we did that. There's no going back. So it's clear to me that the US is much more willing to make concessions from the Iranians. The Iranians know if you stand there long enough, we'll throw something at them, and we are. And if we do, if we actually put our signature on a piece of paper, uh, we will not be able to go to our allies, not any of them, not Jordan, not Israel, not Saudi Arabia, and say, trust us. Yeah, clearly that's, that's, that's true. I mean, and that's, an, that's amazing and something obviously not well known about um, Iran, basically, uh, you know, hijacking and shaking down South Korea with U.S. permission 
in order to, you know, it's a, you know, these are the, this is truly the definition of a rogue regime. Um, and yet the United States is willing to yes. go along with this. Here's what I would do first. I would reverse the seating order, okay? Since Iran is a rogue regime, and since Iran does things like kidnap South Korean soldiers, not to mention American sailors, I would reverse the room. I would tell the Iranians to wait in the hall. And I would sit with my friends and allies, the British, the French, uh, the Germans, and even my own adversaries, the Chinese and the, and the Russians. And we would have that conversation. And Iran would be told what the world expects from it. It's not going to happen. I don't trust it to happen. But rather than asking myself, if I were the Biden administration, what's the best I can do here? I would make a demand that everybody would go, wait, what? And we might get somewhere. We should not be outside the room. The rogues should be outside. Well, that's good advice, but um, I guess it's not, probably not going to happen. If, if, you're, if your goal is... Then we, I mean, then one we of the leave. critiques of the Obama administration's um, negotiation, negotiating strategy with Iran was that clearly they wanted a deal at any price. They kept asking for things. Iran said no. And yes. Obama kept saying, OK, well, that's, you know, we can't get what we want, so let's get what we can get. And in the end, we got a deal that expires within the end of this decade and doesn't stop Iran from building illegal missiles or committing, you know, or being the world state leading state sponsor of terror. Um, so we're just going back to that um, because, you know, the, the administration is committed to it as, you know, as, as the, the only guarantor that Iran won't go nuclear. But, uh, okay. Wait, wait, I have to stop you there. There is no, no mm -hmm. guarantor that Iran will not go nuclear, with one possible exception. Iran has cheated on this deal from the beginning. We know that. Even the IAEA now admits that Iran cheated from the beginning, from before the deal, through the deal, up to... Uh, the only thing that is likely to stop Iranian cheating is the series of explosions that have happened, first in Natanz, and the one that nobody seems to have reported on, which mm -hmm. is the explosion in Bushir last week where the Iranian government announced it was taking Bushir offline because it had an electrical problem and it would probably be out for three days. Uh, it's more than three days, it's not back, Never mind. Things like that don't happen. So it is conceivable that some other force will figure out a way to put the Iranian nuclear program out of commission. The Iran deal did no such thing. The Iran deal has right. been cheated and even on if it were... from the beginning. So even entering back into the deal you can't enter back into the deal because the terms of the deal right. have been long and even surpassed. if it had been observed, even if they had been punctilious about it, which, as you rightly say, they have not been not even close, the deal expires eventually. The, the, uh, the sunset clauses give yes. Iran a legal path to a bomb eventually if they're just patient enough, but they haven't been that. They see no reason to be that patient. But you raise an important point. Um, Exactly. What is Israel going to do about this situation? Where, where does that leave Israel and its new government, um, whose position on Iran is, is no different than the previous Israeli government, I might add? Um, what, what, you know, do they have yes. Americans, can they count on American support for continued, you know, accidents happening, uh, accidents and accidental fires, accidental electrical problems? Um, accidental accidents happening to Iranian scientists. Um, can they count on American support for that? And what does that mean? And how does that, where does that figure into the context of what's going on in Vienna and what the administration thinks is going to happen? First of all, let me say, the Israelis never acknowledge what they've done until long after they've done it. So you know that they stole the Iranian uh, nuclear arsenal, uh, nuclear archive, because they showed you the archive well after. They took care of it, but one of the really important things about that archive is they didn't do it themselves. They had friends in Iran who helped them, and some of those friends are no longer in Iran, mm. because they can't be. So, so the Israelis extricated people who helped them. I would never bet on what's done by Israelis, what's done by 
other people, what's done by Iranian other people. So to begin with, Israel is not the only country or the only group of people interested in stymieing the Iranian pursuit of nuclear weapons. Can Israel count on American support? Quiet support for some things, I think. People used to say, does Israel have a plane that can fly to Iran and drop a big enough bomb to blow up Iran's nuclear reactor? I mean, I'm old, I remember that conversation. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, you remember it too. Nobody asked that question anymore. It was a silly question at best because never would Iran, never would Israel do that. The um, Fordo nuclear plant, which is a key part of Iran's nuclear program, is under the city of Qom. Yes. As the Iranians say, the holy city of Qom. The city of Qom. So if you're going to drop a bomb on Fordo, you're going to drop it first on the holy city of Qom, and you're going to kill thousands, if not tens of thousands, of Iranian civilians. And that was never going to happen. Israel was never going to do that. So the Israelis have figured out that there are things you can do short of dropping a bomb um, to stymie the program. By the way, there are other things that could be done. I mean, I don't want to suggest that anyone do it, but most of Iran's oil leaves by Karg Island. If you want to really put a hole in the Iranian economy, blow up the oil terminal. So there are lots of things that can be done. I do not think the United States government will be happy about a frontal attack on Iran that hurts the people we don't want to hurt. But I don't think the Israelis are going to do that attack. Things like the Bushir problem, I think we'll turn a blind eye. In the meantime, Iran, an Iran that has been accepted back into the international community and with, with uh, drop sanctions, that kind of changes the equation about Iran in the region, doesn't it? Um, uh, they were genuinely weakened by Trump sanctions. Even the New York Times reported, I recall, that um, you know, terrorists in, in Lebanon and Syria were complaining about you know, shortages. They weren't getting the money that they had gotten before because, because of American pressure on Iran. What's going to happen, um, regardless of the, you know, taking the nuclear question out of, uh, out, of the, uh, out of the equation for a moment, what's going to happen with an Iran, with an Iran that is empowered, and enriched, as it clearly would be, will be, um, by a revived uh, you know, nuclear deal. Um, how does that play out? And what will that mean for the, for the whole region, Israel and, and the Sunni Arab states, as well as the United States? How, how, does that, how is that going to work? Well, look in the region first, because Iran's targets are actually, first targets are in the region, yes, it wants to get rid of the great Satan, but believe me, they understand the limitations. What they're aiming at is Shiite control of the Gulf region and Saudi Arabia and specifically Mecca and Medina, okay, which requires the overthrow of the Saudi government. The Gulf states are very, very aware of their precarious position. It was part of the thinking, although not all of the thinking, behind the Abraham Accords, an alliance with Israel, a friendship with Israel, uh, economic cooperation with all of those things with Israel help them in the face of Iran. So if you weaken the Gulf states and empower Iran, the Gulf states are going to have to make a choice. Either they will get closer to Israel, thinking this is our last hope, these are the only guys who, who understand what the problem is, or they're going to start looking to ingratiate themselves with the Iranian regime because they think they cannot fight it. If you can't right. fight it, you have to acquiesce to it. And that is the fear that the Israelis have. Aside from the Hezbollah problem and the Hamas problem, you have the problem of Israel's new friends. And I don't think they're only friends because of Iran. I think there is a much deeper uh, coincidence of interest. But the security issue may drive them away at some point if the United States isn't helpful. That's a, that's a very frightening prospect, but I think it's a very realistic one, considering that a yes. lot of the people in the Biden administration, as much as they pay lip service to the Abraham Accords as something that is, a, you know, as in principle good, it's also somewhat irrelevant to their main interests in terms of diplomacy in the Middle East. They're still focused on the Palestinians and reviving, you know, hopes for a two-state solution that the Palestinians never seem to want um, as much as everyone 
in Washington often seems to want it for them and, and in Europe, um, is, is, the, is, is the lack of prioritization for the Abraham Accords and, and keeping um, the Sunni Arab world uh, friendly with Israel, um, is that going to play into, you know, post, you know, the post uh, new Iran deal um, reality? And is the United States going to perhaps acquiesce to um, Israel's, you know, re resumed isolation? And perhaps because they think it will somehow, you know, jumpstart peace with the Palestinians. You know, that, that chimera again. That, that requires unpacking. This is where you can be Antony Blinken and be pro-Israel. And I truly believe that he likes Israel. I truly believe that he does not want to see Israel under siege, disappear, none of those things. You, you can be perfectly pro-Israel and wrong at the same time, okay? He is wrong, as are many, many peace processors in Washington who believe that the key to peace in the region is the Palestinian-Israeli issue. And the Abraham Accords are a huge distraction, which is why, by the way, uh, in parlance now in the U.S. government, they're not the Abraham Accords. They're normalization agreements. Anybody can have normalization. You know, it doesn't doesn't suggest mm -hmm. peace and it doesn't suggest brotherhood. You can't get rid of it, but you can downgrade it. OK, they want to refocus on the Palestinians. And here you have two problems. First of all, the Abraham Accord countries are not looking to put the Palestinians first. They understand that the Palestinians are corrupt. They are not democratic. And by the way, the Sunni Arab states are not democratic either. I'm not suggesting that they're democracies, but they are traditional sheikdoms. And they made a decision that economics and the benefits for their people are important. And they don't see that in the Palestinians. They see Israel as a means to that end. And that's fine with them. And if you watch the, um, the Bahrainis mm -hmm. every Friday afternoon, they do a Shabbat thing in Bahrain. It's very nice. They are not likely to hop back over into the let's make Palestine brigade. That's the first problem. Second problem is what I alluded to before. The Palestinians do not want what we want for them. What's the best the Palestinians can get from the peace processors? It is a split rump state squeezed in between Jordan and Israel plus Gaza. That's not good enough. That's not what they want. They believe, at least the leadership, and I'm not talking about the, the people, they believe that a mistake was made in 1948 when the international community gave land to Jewish people for a state that wasn't their land to give. They want it back. So if you want to jump in bed with them, and if you want to say, yes, let's make a Palestinian state, the priority, I have a question. What is the map of Palestine? that the Palestinians accept is, I don't know, is, um, is, Geni is Hebron in Israel? Is Haifa in Israel? Is Sfat in Israel? Is Tel Aviv in Israel? Where's the map that tells you what Israel is? There is no Palestinian right. map that includes a state of Israel. Mm -hmm. The Israelis have produced many, many maps. They haven't because they don't believe in it. So again, we're putting on them concept that we want. We want you to be willing to take a split rump state. Jordan hates you. Israel doesn't really care for you, but we want you to take it and be happy with it. Not likely. You know, it's another one of those trees you bark up, but you're not going to climb it. Well, that's it. You know, that's, it's a very important point. Um, and I think there's a clear distinction here. I think there are a lot of people in Congress, um, in both parties and in the administration, who are somewhat realistic about Iran, that understand that the Ayatollahs don't want peace, that they are Islamist, um, some rationalize support for the nuclear deal because they think it's you know the best chance for accommodation or at least to prevent the worst scenarios. But there aren't that many people in Washington that have that truly believe that you know um, Ayatollah Khamenei and his perhaps successor really want to get right with the world. However, there is still an overwhelming number of people, probably an overwhelming majority in Congress, who still believe in the two-state solution as a realistic option 
and whatever, you know, as much as they may be very pro-Israel and support Israel, they still believe that diplomacy towards satisfying the leadership that, as you have rightly pointed out, doesn't want to live in peace with Israel and has rejected peace deals repeatedly over the last 20 odd years um, because it would cause them, you know, it would require them to give up their 100 year old war against Zionism and uh, recognize the legitimacy of a Jewish state, no matter where its borders would be drawn. Um, yet Americans still seem to believe that that's what Palestinians want. Yes, they do. They believe that. And allow me to ask, because we've been friends for a long time, if you could consider getting rid of that concept of a two-state solution, because there are three governing bodies between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. Two of the, any two of those are at war with each other at any given time. Hamas and Fatah are still at a war that began in 2007. Uh, Hamas is at war with Israel. Palestinian Authority and Israel, they're not very good friends either. In order to That's get to a right. state there is solution, already one of the an independent states states state in all but name in Gaza, which and the is often way, forgotten. That's right. And it doesn't plan to go anywhere. In fact, part of the rocket war in May, a lot of these things happen across the bodies of Jews. The, the rocket war in May was really about Hamas looking at the Palestinian Authority and saying, we're going to take power from you. Mahmoud Abbas canceled the presumed election, mm -hmm. and Hamas said, no, that was because we were going to win the election. So now we are going to start making inroads in the West Bank. And by the way, they've done a pretty good job. They come off looking younger, more aggressive, um, more modern, believe it or not, for Islamists, right? They come across. So now you see Hamas flags in Jerusalem, which you never saw before. That war is heating up again, and that's a big war. Somebody should win it. Maybe, I don't know, maybe not. But you can't talk about two states. Yeah, it is. That's exactly right. Um, and yet that is a topic that um, certainly you doesn't get much attention from, from, the, from the administration or really from the foreign policy establishment in the United States and, and elsewhere. Um, they still take it as a given that Palestinian peace is possible, that unity between Fatah and Hamas, you know, the, which is you know even yes. crazier, yes. I think, than than a two state solution, um, that that's possible, and that all it takes is enough goodwill from the you know, from the international community and enough goodwill and concessions from Israel. Um, those sorts of illusions, as I said, you know, it, it's possible to, you know, get some recognition of reality when you talk about Iran, um, because Iran has a very bad reputation in the United States. People, there's still some historical memory of the, the, the hostage taking, um, terrorism. You know, Americans are a little queasy about Iran on, under the best of circumstances. And yet the illusions about the, the, the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians seem impenetrable. They, they seem invincible. Um, how, how is how has that happened? Um, why is that has that never been able to be successfully challenged? You know, we had four years of the Trump administration. They also, you know, you know it also paid lip service to to the concept of a two state solution, um, albeit being much more realistic about the Palestinians and their place in in the region, and realistic about the fact that much of these certainly the Sunni Arab world considers the idea of another unstable, you know, Arab state in, in, the, in the region that would probably be dominated by Islamists, such as Hamas, is, is not good for them, let alone, you know, uh, whatever they think about what's good for the Palestinians. Um, and yet these illusions continue. Um, you know, they sail on. It's like an unsinkable ship. It's a failure on the part of friends of Israel uh, and and. Israelis themselves, to explain this in terms that people can understand. It's so much nicer to think that we can just solve a problem by discussing it and people will be reasonable and you give a little here and he'll give a little there. The reason it doesn't work with Iran is that there is some memory left of 1979 and 
um, the takeover of the embassy. Interestingly, the PLO killed two American and one French diplomat, uh, but that doesn't seem to, to register to people. And mm. I think we have not properly made the case. And the Israelis don't really make the case all that well either because they are hoping to find some mechanism. And mm. here, by the way, I don't blame them. They live in the middle of it. They're hoping to find a mechanism to get out of it. It's a big problem for them. You notice in, in Israel, there is right. full agreement about the nature of Hamas across the political parties, left, right, and center. They know what Hamas is, but there is actually a serious conversation in Israel about what to do about it. There are people who say, we buy ourselves five or seven years of peace by taking out Hamas assets and reminding them that we can still kill them. Uh, and that's good enough. There are other people who say, no, we need a ground offensive so that we can take out the, the things on the ground and find more stuff and kill more people and do whatever. And then there are people who say, look, you just have to go back and reoccupy Gaza. Those are three strains of conversation. I will admit the third yeah. one has very few takers. Almost nobody wants to suggest reoccupying Gaza. But the level of military commitment to crushing Hamas is a subject for discussion, even though they all understand what it is. There is no hope for conversation with Hamas, none, zero. And yet they still mm -hmm. have this conversation. Why? Because it's their army. You know, we can be a little bit cavalier. Oh, well, you know, it's just a few rockets and, oh, well, just wait a little longer. And, oh, you know, never mind those balloons that are designed to have small children pick them up and have their hands blown off. We have the luxury of distance. The Israelis do not. And right. so... They handle where do you the way see they the, find Where do you best. see the the administration, this you know, Biden administration going with respect to the peace process? And you know, they have been focused on Vienna, they've been focused on Iran. Um, they paid some lip lip service to, to Israel, they paid some lip service to the Palestinians and made some gestures toward the Palestinians that have upset you know, the, the pro Israel community. But do you sense any real energy or interest in pursuing again that you know to go down the garden path again of, of a of a peace process that you know i think realistic people knows uh, will never lead to anything that remotely resembles peace let alone um dealing with the reality of of hamas being coming the strong horse if you will within palestinian politics No, I don't see enthusiasm for this. I think there is some understanding that the Palestinians had a shot. They didn't take it. They are mired in their own problems right now. I think what the Biden administration would really like is to restore U.S. what the U.S. calls U.S. humanitarian aid to the Palestinians um, through UNRWA, which is interesting because the head of UNRWA was thrown out of Gaza because he said the Israelis were very careful in yep. their airstrikes and they didn't kill people. For this, the head of UNRWA was, was deposed. Um, UNRWA, however, is, is not a useful body in terms of the distribution of aid and keeping it from Hamas. There's a problem with, the, with mm -hmm. aid to the Palestinian Authority. I mean, we have the Taylor Force Act and we're not supposed to give money to them until they give up paying salaries to terrorists. We are ignoring that bit. And saying, oh no, we have to, we have to work with them. So I think that's as far as the administration wants to go. They want to put some money in. They want to look as if they care. They want to look as if they are being helpful at a humanitarian level. Do they want to invest? I doubt it, because the Palestinian Authority can't afford a peace process with Israel that doesn't include Hamas, and they can't afford a peace process that does include Hamas. So. It's from Abu yeah, Mazen's clearly, point of view. Yeah, clearly Mahmoud Abbas not a good no, idea. Uh, no, Abu Mazen uh, has no interest in peace. I mean, if he had interest in peace, he would have made peace 13 years ago when Ehud Olmert uh, offered him uh, you know, a two-state solution. Um, never mind the previous offers made to Yasser Arafat. Um, so, but even by those gestures, this you know, as you say, they want to get there's you know, some skin back in the game and, and to be seen you know, the Biden administration to be seen as as doing humanitarian work for the Palestinians. There's a price to that because any rebuilding of Gaza 
by definition, is going to strengthen Hamas because it's ultimately going to go into their pockets in one way or another. Unquestionable. It's unquestionable. Somebody in Washington, and I won't embarrass him by giving his name, somebody actually said that we should look at the multinational force in the Sinai as, a, as the kind of model for distributing aid in uh, Gaza mm -hmm. that, you know, these guys come in and it's internationalist sort of stuff. Um, the multinational force in Sinai is operated by the American military. And if he's suggesting that the American military come into Gaza to keep the aid out of <laughs> right. Hamas's hands, first of all, he's nuts. And secondly, allow me to say, as the, as the mother and mother-in-law of career American military personnel, no, no way. Do I want yeah. American military personnel yeah. operating in the Gaza Strip? Not my country, not my problem, not my ally, not my friend. Why would I put them there? So I don't think we have any mechanism for doing this, except giving up our principles and understanding that the aid will go there. By the way, Benny Gantz yeah. said that. Uh, sadly, he is, he is quite right. Benny Gantz says, I'm not naive. I understand that if we do this or they do this. Yeah. I know where it's going. So let me just in sort of in conclusion, where do you see the focus of the pro-Israel community in the United States in the next couple of years? What what should they be uh, what should they be thinking about? What policies should they be most worried about and what should be, you know, what they are asking this administration and their friends in Congress to do? Um, you know, what should be at the top of their agenda uh, going forward and at least within the next 2 years say? Not, mm -hmm. not they. We. Okay. Well, we. all right. I count myself among them. I count you. I count you among them. What should we be doing? The, the first thing is we had better be looking at our own situation here in the United States. We're a pro-Israel community, but if you saw what happened in Philadelphia this weekend, there are people who say you can't be a pro-Israel community and still be a full participant in America, and that is the fundamental fundamental difference between America and every other place we as a Jewish community have lived in the diaspora. We are here and we are citizens and this is our home and this is our country. The, the Philadelphia Food Festival that excluded an Israeli immigrant, um, the, the notice that the food festival put out was, we need to make everybody who comes to this festival comfortable and they have to feel secure and they have to feel safe. In other words, you mm -hmm. can't be safe if the Jews are here. They didn't say that. The implication is you can't have Jews. So I think that if we, as the American Jewish community, don't stand for our rights, first of all, as Americans, we're going to have a lot of trouble being the pro-Israel community. So that's number one. Number two, when you look at the state of Israel, um, we have to be reminding people all the time of what Israel actually is. When people get up and talk about apartheid and they get up and they talk about all kinds of terrible things, it's our job, it's our obligation, and it's the obligation of our friends to say, no, you're wrong. We should be taking Ilhan Omar to Israel. Now, she doesn't want to go. She doesn't want to go with the Israeli government or, or a pro-Israel group. That's not my problem. But people like that need to go. People like that have to see Israel, not Palestine, because they already think they know it's Palestine. They have to see Israel, and that's our job. If they refuse, that's their problem. We have to be outspoken advocates at home and for that's, Israel. That's well said, and I think you, by by citing what you know that incident in Philadelphia, I think you you go really to the heart of the problem for for the for the pro-Israel community and for American Jews is that our main political problem isn't as as serious as as the debate about Iran is as serious as the debate about uh, efforts to re-engage the Palestinians are. As long as we are silent or complicit in the rise of critical race theory and intersectionalism within American society, we are, um, we, we are assisting in our own demise. We are, uh, you know, we are tacitly accepting that we are you know, beneficiaries of white privilege, that we are somehow part of a racist oppression and that Israel is an apartheid state. If we don't get that right, if we don't stop that cold, 
Um, and that's a very hard task. It's a very hard ask for America, the American yes, Jew, organized is. American Jewish world. You, you're, you've been involved in the organized Jewish world, but much of the organized Jewish world is much is you know committed to the idea of social justice, and they define you know sort of critical race theory and white fragility now as part of that social justice agenda, and they've accepted that, and that really just undermines the. The, the legitimacy of, of American Jewry and uh, and Israel right there and then. Great. Well, Shoshana, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this week. Um, you've given us some great insights and a lot of food for thought, so thank you. Thanks again for joining us on Top Story. See you next week. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode brought to you by the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. Visit us at JNS.org and please follow at Amazon and Spotify wherever you listen to podcasts.